Hi there, everybody. Welcome to another Chem Complete Lecture. And in today's lecture, we are going to continue our discussion of alkene synthesis by looking at alkene hydroxylation, which is sometimes also referred to as diol formation or the formation of two alcohols in place of the alkenes pi bond when we undergo a synthesis with certain reagents. So we're going to take a look at the ways that we can accomplish that coming up on the channel right now. All right, so alkene hydroxylation. Hydroxylation itself, as I mentioned at the opening of this video, is going to involve alkenes and the addition of a hydroxyl or alcohol functional group to each carbon that is involved in the alkene pi bond. And this forms what is called a diol. So the term diol, di referring to two, and all, O-L, is the suffix that we use when we are discussing the alcohol functional groups. So a diol is two alcohol groups. Now, what this generally would look like is that we would have the alkene, and then with the generalized alkene that we've got here, and we'll look at more specific examples in a minute, we are going to expose it to hydroxylation. And we'll talk about what reagents can actually perform the hydroxylation reaction and what their outcomes will be. But what we can generally expect is that we will get two alcohol groups, one on each carbon that was involved in the double bond, as well as the other returned portionalities that we found present around the alkene to begin with. Okay, so that is the general overview of hydroxylation. Now, there are two different methods that can be used when it comes to hydroxylation. And the interesting part about this is that each method is going to lead to a stereospecific outcome. So if you've been following along with the lecture series, you know that we look at regiochemistry and stereochemistry. Now regiochemistry isn't going to be applied here because we're really just adding two of the same group. We don't need to concern ourselves with a, for instance, alcohol and hydrogen the way we would in a hydroxylation. So when we take a look at this, we've got two different methods, okay? And the first one is going to be the use of osmium tetroxide, OSO4, and that is going to give a syn, that should be a Y there, sorry about that, that is going to give a syn diol addition when followed with aqueous sodium bisulfite. So the use of osmium tetraoxide can be used for syn addition. Now remember syn means on the same face or the same side of the double bond. So let's take a look at an example and what it would deliver here. So we'll go ahead and we'll start with a six-membered ring. Let's make it a cyclohexene and then let's throw some methyls on here just so that we can be very clear about the stereochemical outcomes of this method. All right, so the first thing that we're going to do, we're going to expose it to the osmium tetraoxide. Now, osmium tetraoxide will typically be used in a solvent like pyridine, some sort of an aromatic base solvent that helps to assist in this reaction itself. Pyridine is probably the most common of the bunch. Now, what is extremely important to understand here is the intermediate that is going to form from the use of the osmium tetraoxide. So if I take a look at the intermediate, this osmium tetraoxide is going to need to add to the same face for its intermediate. So similar to some of the other reactions we've seen with alkenes, I will end up getting the addition on the same face. Now, you've got two oxygens that are here. Both of them will connect to the osmium. And then the osmium will still have two additional oxygens like this that have pi bonds there. Okay, so osmium tetraoxide, osmium can have so many electrons around it because it is a higher level transition metal. It's got lots of orbitals available for the bonding of each of these individual components. 
So what I've drawn here is the intermediate that you would get. And we can see that this intermediate is going to be cyclic in nature, not just because of the cyclic starting material, but similar to the bromonium ion or some of the other three-membered rings that we found. We do have a connection here that comes to a point. And so this intermediate itself is cyclic. And the correct term that we use here is that this will be a cyclic osmate, O-S-M-A-T-E, intermediate. And this is important because you can see the beginnings here of the uh, stereochemistry that is going to be so important. So because the intermediate has this portion right here where they are both added to the same face, that means that when I turn around and I work this reaction up in the second step with the sodium bisulfite, which is NaHSO3, and this is going to be aqueous, so we would also write or just include the fact that this would be in water. The intermediate itself, the cyclic intermediate, will cleave off and it will provide hydroxyl groups back. So what I end up with is I've got two OH groups, one on each carbon that was involved in the original double bond. And because of that osmium tetraoxide intermediate, I end up with them both on the same face. So I get a syn addition of the alcohol groups, which is very evident here in the way that I've drawn this. Okay, now this is a 100% syn addition that is observed as far as the stereochemical outcomes. All right, so let's talk about the other method that we can use, and that is going to be epoxides. Now, I'm not going to get into a whole bunch of details regarding how epoxides actually form in their mechanism because they are an ether. They're a cyclic ether component, and that is really covered more in ether chapters than alkene chapters. But I will expose you to the main reagent that is used typically in doing this with alkenes, and we will take a look at the remainder of the mechanism to understand why we've got the anti-addition that is going to occur here relative to the syn addition. So let's take a look at an example. We're going to start with the same exact alkene. So let's draw our six-membered ring. We'll put the pi bond there, and then we've got the methyl substituents. Now, the reagent that is first used, because we have to make an epoxide before we can actually form the diol, is going to be MCPBA. And this is an abbreviation that you'll come across if you're in organic chemistry. And this means meta-chloroperoxybenzoic acid. Okay, so it is going to be a peroxy acid, which is similar to a carboxylic acid, but it has an additional oxygen, excuse me, an additional oxygen between the OH group and the carbonyl group. Okay, and then it obviously that uh, peroxy acid portionality is attached to a benzene ring that also has a chloro in the meta position relative to it. So if you're not familiar with um, aromatic terminology, some of that might be confusing, but just know that this reagent, the MCPBA, is going to create a perox uh, an epoxide. So if I take a look here, the epoxide is a three-membered oxygen ring that is stuck between the two carbons. So this is what an epoxide would look like. Now, the methyl groups would be on the other side. And so you'll notice that we have, again, an intermediate, no carbocation, and we have sort of this three-membered ring or a cyclic intermediate here. All right now, you might be tempted to think that this is going to be syn addition, However, the following step involves a nucleophilic attack of a base. So you're going to have hydroxide available. Maybe this is in the form of something like sodium hydroxide. Okay, and this will be aqueous as well. Now, in this case, the hydroxide is going to come in and it will attack through a substitution type of reaction. However, when we come in to attack and substitute, we don't kick anything off of the ring, but we do kick this epoxide open. So this epoxide will have to open and give these electrons to this oxygen here 
in order to allow the OH group to come in. Now, because this epoxide is kind of taking up this front portion or this uh, above portion on the ring, the other hydroxyl group must come in from the back side. And so this is what's going to lead to the anti-observation as far as stereochemistry is concerned. So we would then get an intermediate that would look like this. You would have the OH that came in from the back side that is now present. That has inverted or moved the methyl group to the front of the ring. We then have the leftovers from the epoxide, that three-membered oxygen, as O, but it's going to be O minus. We're not going to have the hydroxyl group there quite yet. And then we would still have the other methyl group in its original positioning. So if you look back, I mentioned this is in water. And so you can regenerate your hydroxide by exposing this to water. This oxygen, using one of its pairs, can come down, grab a proton, and then you can regenerate the OH- minus from that particular uh, reaction there. And so what we end up with when that happens is that we will get the diol addition, but now, as you can hopefully see if you were following along with the mechanism, we have the anti-formation. So now we've got an alcohol that's in the back of the ring, and we would also have an alcohol that's going to be on the front of the ring. Again, that one was the one that was left over from the epoxide once it split open, and then it needed to grab a proton for itself. And so there you go. Now we have a diol addition that would show anti-stereochemistry results instead of sin. So this is useful because we can do both sin and anti-addition for the hydroxylation reactions that we have here. All right, now... If we look at this just as a summary, okay, if I take an alkene and I expose it first to osmium tetraoxide, as well as in a second subsequent step, the sodium bisulfite, and again, remember that this would be aqueous, so we would have this in water, I will get the sin addition, meaning they would both appear on the same side of this molecule or the same face of the double bond when they add. And then in a similar fashion, but different stereochemical outcome, I can create a diol by first exposing it to the MCPBA reagent, which will create the epoxide. And then in a subsequent step, I can expose this to base, and again, that would be aqueous, so water would be available in that case. Okay, And what I end up with would be the anti-product, meaning that I've got one that would form here, and I would get another that would form here, and they would be on opposite faces or opposite sides of the original double bond. And I do want to mention, uh, for some of you that may have been exposed to ether synthesis, or some of you who may already know quite a bit, you could use acidic conditions here as well. So you can use H3O plus to accomplish the same thing. Um, again, more details can be found in an ether chapter, but I just do want to mention that. Usually when students are first learning this reaction, uh, because it's kind of surrounding the general timeline that we would learn SN1 and SN2, using hydroxide makes sense in terms of having a nucleophile or a base uh, instead of protonating that epoxide and opening it up. So that takes care of everything I wanted to discuss for the hydroxylation reactions or the diol formation as they are known. So Again, head on over to chemcomplete.com. You can get lots of free resources to help you there, and it is a great place to support the channel. We have very affordable guides if you're feeling lost, you feel like your instructor just isn't making sense. Head on over there, and you can show some support. Five, ten dollars you can usually pick up a guide that may support you with something that's more complicated to understand. If you comment or you have any questions, I will try to get back to you. Dropping a like always helps to boost us in the algorithm and get this information out to other people. So if you felt it was useful, please do that. And as always, if you subscribe, you will get up to the minute information whenever something is released during your organic chemistry career. So thank you so much for learning with me today because I know there's lots of options out there and I will see everybody 
in the next lecture. Take care.